opportunity to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Jeff Marlett from the College of St. Rose, in our state, in our own state, where he is the Associate Professor of Religious Studies and also teaches courses in the American Studies program as well. Professor Marlett uh, received his bachelor's degree at an institution that I always tell my own students ranks among the top 10 undergraduate programs in the country, uh, Wabash College. Jeff, you're gonna break into tears, I can take the flight quick, but people who go to all the Cross and Princeton, so. He received a master's degree from Vanderbilt University and his doctorate from St. Louis University where he worked with our own Dr. Jim Fisher, now at Fordham, at that time, I believe, Dancing Professor of Religion at St. Louis University. His first book was published in, in 2002 with the title, Saving the Heart and Catholic Missionaries in Royal America. And that received, I actually put some reviews online, so it received very good reviews. Uh, more recently, Jeff has been working on the topic of Catholics and professional sports, uh, a topic reflected in several papers he's been giving at uh, Cooperstown, New York, the Baseball Hall of Fame. A recent one was on Leo de Rocher, is that correct? Leo de Rocher uh, in a conference, uh, a symposium entitled Baseball in American Culture. Uh, this evening, Jeff is going to speak to us for about 45 minutes uh, on Vince Lombardi and, excuse me, the lecture he's entitled Winning at Any Cost, Vince Lombardi and the Catholic Contribution to America's Must Win Session. And at the end of his uh, presentation, he welcomes questions from all of you. So please join me in welcoming our students.
high school graduating class at their Tunisia reunion. And for those of you who are still in college, this is a, a wonderful new opportunity because see, you all are on Facebook and all these social networking sites. A number of my friends discovered Flickr and Facebook right after the graduate, or right after the, uh, the uh, reunion. And so even though I didn't get to go, I got to participate vicariously by watching it all online. And in the midst of all this, there was a gentleman with whom I went to school who played on the football baseball teams, uh, something that with much less hair on top, but a lot of hair here, <laughs> growing here. And the reason why, well, I, I saw a picture of him later, so I know he didn't have a whole lot of hair left on his head before in the mid 40s, but uh, he was wearing a Yankee hat. I see a gentleman with back hair there, that was pretty good. It's, it's Ford, I'm wearing the Bronx, the, the Yankees got the Yankees playoffs. Uh, and I was kind of like, when in the world did that guy become a Yankee fan? And then I thought back to myself, I was thinking of this material here. Uh, the first football team I ever read about was Vince Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers. In 1977, I was in third grade. And so there are a number of us, uh, seven to ten years after uh, Coach Lombardi's death, the first football team to follow in the 70s, a number of guys my generation, we all became Packer fans. That was Vince Lombardi's team. They were the first two, they, they won the first two Super Bowls. Even though it was in the heyday of the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, there were a bunch of us who still hung on to Vince Lombardi. And so that leads me to uh, two phrases here, which I uh, yeah, First of all, that everyone knows both of these phrases. And the thing to notice about them is that these are Catholics that coined these phrases. First of all, Neil DeRochers, nice guys finish last. And then Vince Lombardi uh, winning is everything. It's the only thing. Now, as it turns out, neither one of these are a direct quote. Leo uh, said something kind of like this, but not exactly. He was actually being quoted by the, uh, the New York Press Corps when he was at a, uh, a baseball game for uh, the Giants and the Dodgers, and the Giants were being managed by a guy named Mel Ott, who was a great home run hitter and a nice guy and a terrible manager. And Leo's point was that basically, you know, it doesn't matter how nice they are, they, they still suck. You know, they're still in last place in the National League. And it turns out Lombardi's quote about winning was also a paraphrase from a much earlier coach, a man named Fielding Yost, who was the longtime head coach at the University of Michigan. And on that note, see, the, one of the things about all of this is that this is Ford University, alma mater, Vince Lombardi. As we'll find out in a second, when, when scholars of American Catholicism pay attention to sports, a lot of them follow sports, but when they pay attention to sports to scholarly endeavor, the only school that they study, you all know. Notre Dame. There's nothing wrong with Notre Dame. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that there's a lot of other Catholics playing the same sports in a lot of other schools. <laughs> and at some point, you might want to study them. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, for example, you know, I'm from the Midwest, and uh, it, this is one of the things that kind of shows the difference between geographical differences or perceptions of Catholicism. Uh, it was a big shock to me to take a class in American politics for the first time and realize that Catholic schools were uh, something that people who weren't rich had to send their kids to. Uh, where I grew up, uh, Catholic schools are for rich people. And rich people, regardless of what they believe. And so it was very, very, uh, very surprising and very, very eye opening to me to learn about you know, the ways in which Catholic schools served as you know, an identity institution for the poor. And that kind of plug is in here because when you look back at uh, the other events, uh, when you Google them, uh, these numbers have gone down the past couple of years. When you used to Google them, a couple of years ago, 2007, you'd get about 10,000 ads together. Now you're going about 2,000, maybe some of the websites are starting to close. Obviously, you get you know, six to seven times as much for uh, uh, Vincent Barty's new wheel brochure. The thing is, though, is that one of the things these phrases do is that they give us a positive thing. Does anyone play fairly anymore? Uh, you know, we have all these steroids in baseball. Bill Belichick cheated. He taped, you know, the Patriots. The Patriots taped the Jets. The Patriots taped the Rams. You know, all this kind of stuff. But what you end up having is kind of like a morality play between um, American sports. You know, and this is a, for the Washington Post uh, two years ago, where uh, Robert Sanderson says basically, you know, we like winners. America loves winners, but we especially like winners who win cleanly. Uh, and when people don't win cleanly, well, then you know, they, they sold their soul. Barry Bonds, Marion Jones, Bill Belichick, 
Sergeant, maybe you get the A rod. You know, one of the problems about talking about the Yankees here in the Bronx, so I don't want to seem like I'm biting the hand that feeds, but you know, one of the when you study the history of baseball, there are, of course, the legions of Yankee fans. And let's just exclude the Red Sox for a second because I'm not privy to them either. That's my wife's side of the family. Um, yeah, I know. So you know, when you're praying for intercessions, they're there off the run up from our lead. Um, the rest of the nation hates the Yankees. As you know, they, they, of course, everyone says so. <laughs> it's just kind of like Notre Dame or some of the other schools like this. And the good thing is, though, when the Yankees cheat, it compounds the morality play. So when the Yankees lose the World Series, I'm not saying they are, I say they did the last time, you see, well, look, you know, money can't buy everything. Bill Belichick is caught up in Spygate, videotaping the Jets. That year, the Patriots go undefeated. They're two minutes away from the best season ever. And the Giants, with a hard-ass Irish Catholic coach, Tom Coughlin, beats them, you know, with, with Plaxico Burris, a man also of, uh, let's just say, questionable decision-making skills. And the point is, and the reason why I'm saying this, because Sam has got a point here, we love winners, and we also love clean winners. The problem is, though, when the people we like win, whether it's the Yankees or Notre Dame or whoever, we don't care. You know, if you have any friends who are out of this, it's wrong. You know, but if you do know any people who are Patriots fans, do any of the Patriots fans want to give back the Super Bowl rings? No, of course not. If the Yankees go on to win number 27, 27. Is anyone who's a Yankee fan really going to care about all the things that they hear about A Rod? No. I'm 27. Who cares? Uh, if the Red Sox do anything, I'm a Cardinals fan, you know, uh, who cares? You know? And so one of the things I think that Samus is missing here is that what America would really like is winning, uh, first and foremost. And if we win honorably, that's nice. And some of that epic comes from. These guys finish last. Winning is everything. It's the only thing. So you've got that kind of a thing going. And when you study American Catholics, though, usually this is not to uh, denigrate either of these folks here. You usually get like a customary list of like, the usual suspects, like Dorothy Day on the right and Father Daniel Berry on the left. Uh, prophetic figures committed to social justice, willing to cut against the grain. All very good. And I'm not in any way trying to criticize this. One of the reasons why we say that, though, is because of this. And the older model of studying Catholics, to backtrack, and it's going to seem like I don't want to seem like I'm fighting the hand of peace after all, Father Mass is fighting me. Uh, but there's a certain way of, there are numbers of different ways of studying American Catholics, and the so called older way is one that focuses on institutions, the clergy, prominent lay people like Lord Day, um, as Patrick Allen, who's a professor of history at Emory University said, he wrote once in a book in 1997, over a decade ago, for all the ink that spilled on basically, he said, all, for all the ink that people spill on Dorothy Day, at the time she was alive, especially when she was most active in the 30s and 40s, the vast majority of Americans, especially American Catholics, thought she was, this is Alice Turner, an unpatriotic crank. Uh, it, you know, and so that's pathetic, speaks against the great culture. Very difficult to be a pacifist after, nine, after Pearl Harbor. Uh, if you know anyone in the Catholic worker movement, uh, you know that after 9-11, uh, around the country, just through New York, you know, the Catholic workers wrestled with, you know, <laughs> we just got, you know, attacked. Uh, Sister Madeleine Wolf from, uh, from uh, St. Mary's College in, uh, next door to Notre Dame in South Indiana, uh, having women study theology. And then also notice the geographical uh, focus, the East Coast, the city, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and in this case, Chicago. Chicago is viewed in this view as being kind of like, well, you know, some of you might remember the old New Yorker cover of the New Yorker's view of the world. There's New York City, this vast chasm in Los Angeles. And uh, the older way of studying Catholics in America falls right into that. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is that Lombardi has a foot in this, or I should say did have a foot. He was part and parcel representative of this as well. Since the 80s, things have changed a bit. <laughs> Do people like Jim Fisher and Father Bass and others. Yeah, right, you know, like, uh, Kevin Smith's movie Dogma. Uh, it was Jim Fisher uh, who was the first person to say that Kevin Smith's movie should be considered as being Catholic productions. 
And so this is, my, my students at St. Rose, and the vast majority of students around the world, read Kevin Smith's movies as a, as a critique of religion. And all you gotta do is just pay a little bit more attention to see there's a, there's sort of a question being raised, but in some ways, Kevin Smith is an intensely Catholic figure. Um, and that goes along with all the other kind of like the, the, the new way of studying, we're focusing on popular culture, so-called bad Catholics, uh, people like uh, the jungle doctor Tom Dooley, who was a heroic figure, uh, musical figures like Madonna, or some of you might, I don't know, they're popular, they're actually based in New York, they're the whole steady. But yeah, so like, yeah, it's kind of, uh, if you listen to uh, uh, Stuck Between Stations, a song which I'll quote here in regards to this here, uh, that's a very intensely Catholic song. And so, but it's not institutionally Catholic. Vince has a foot in this, in this category as well because the, my point is that sports don't figure either place. So Notre Dame football is an institution, but the religious aspects of football itself and the way it functions in the lives of Americans is less obvious. And, I, and not to say it's not studied, but it's not quite the same thing as it, as it perhaps should be. And so therefore, um, today, when we look at someone like Vince Lombardi, Lombardi's view today is being a conservative figure. He got his hair cut once a week, every week, until literally he's on his deathbed. Uh, he was, in the words of his uh, the biographer, David Moranis, who published uh, the best biography of uh, Vince Lombardi in 1989, a book called The Pride Still Matter. In the words of David Moranis, uh, Vince Lombardi was a square. He had one girlfriend, ever, the woman he married, Marie. Uh, and uh, he, he lived football. I guess he was a square. And so therefore, and the other person I could have put up there is Archie Bunker. Uh, and Vince Lombardi died around the time that all the family was on air. And so there is a connection between Vince Lombardi and this other gentleman over here, for those of you who are younger than me, might not know who that is. That's Senator Joe McCarthy from the 50s from Wisconsin, who was a ball buster. Let's just say that he, that he, and the thing was, as far as unpopular as McCarthy is now, as much as McCarthyism in academic circles is, you know, they, if you want to label someone with a bad label, fashion is always bad. That, that's a good smear tactic. And so also is McCarthy. If you're a McCarthy, I believe you're, just, you're, you're, you're trying to ferret someone out. You're playing unfairly. You're mean. You're suspicious. Lombardi now, with his coaching methods and his kind of like rigid morality, is viewed, in some ways, it seems to me, as part of Joe McCarthy's view of Catholicism, not some of the other figures like Dorothy Day. That's a misnomer. Uh, that, that's a, a misinterpretation of facts. Uh, McCarthy was a certain, a certain kind of Catholic, and Lombardi was as well. Um, and, uh, what you get here, though, with Lombardi is a, is a complex figure, and when you study Catholics in, in the United States, one of the things that it always helps to remember is that Catholic figures don't plot out regularly on the spectrum between conservative and liberal in this country. In other words, someone who's a, cat, a very committed Catholic, like Vince Lombardi was, in some places can be very conservative. And in other situations, without changing any of his religious or social positions, it can be very, not very liberal, but certainly more liberal than you might first expect. Uh, and this is true even for someone like, uh, as we point out, even for Leo Brochure. Um, Lombardi uh, embodies this transition. He, like I said, Warren Shoes at Bay, Brooklyn, in 1913. His dad's a butcher. A butcher whose nickname was old 5 by 5 because it represented how he looked. He was about 5 feet tall, about 5 feet wide. He was such a strong man from working. And I thought, my dad's not good in trades. Maybe some of you all have uh, fathers, brothers, or uncles, or cousins who work in the trades. Uh, you know, it was nothing for Vince Lombardi's father to put two children and a family reunion on an old coal lifting shovel. Back when we had coal burning furnaces, put a child in the pail of the shovel and a child on the handle, and lift it up with one arm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you gotta think about that. And he had work tattooed on the four fingers on one hand and play tattooed on the other. And after they got it, it's pretty good. <laughs> the new tattoo, our tattoos are coming back. Vince Lombardi did not get a tattoo. His dad did, though. His dad was the worker. His son, the oldest, and Vince was the oldest of all the Lombardi children, was the, represented where his father's generation wanted to be. It represented the ascendancy into the middle class. 
you know, for some American Catholic scholars, then Lombardi suddenly becomes a non-subject because he's the one who's moved out of the ghetto. He's not the one who, uh, who has stayed in the Italian neighborhood, still going to the old Italian restaurants, who still maintains that notion of the paisan or whatever, or the Irish, or in my wife's case, the French Canadians, or out in the Midwest, if you're Ukrainian, or Chicago, Polish, or you know, here in New York, for that all the above. Lombardi represents, like I said, this, this ascendancy into the middle class. He went to Mass daily. Uh, was a member of the Knights of Columbus. The most recent edition of the, of the Columbia Magazine, which is kind of the magazine that sent out to all the members of the Knights of Columbus, featured Catholics and sports. And the lead figure in the article was Ben Lombardi. Playing a close second, by the way, was the connection between the Knights of Columbus and where the former Yankee Stadium was built. So that's going to be interesting. But once again, the Yankees and Lombardi showed him as well. Um, he went to Mass so frequently in, uh, in Palm Cell in Green Bay that people who worked at the Packers knew if you drove past a certain parish at 756 every morning, every day, you would see Coach Lombardi sneaking into the side door to go to the 8 o'clock Mass. And for those of you who have taken any kind of modern philosophy class, this should ring a bell because that sounds an awful lot like the German philosopher Daniel Kant who was so routine in his daily walk in the afternoon that the people in his village would set the town clock by his walk and they would go past their houses because he was such a, stuck in such a rut. When we talk about that in philosophy, we then move into Kant's philosophical system and his metaphysics and like, you know, the, the systematic approach that Kant took towards uh, trying to understand epistemology. When you apply that to Catholics, well then, you know, uh, I come from the Bible Belt, well, that shows that Catholicism is a religion, not a faith, because Vince is being, has this mechanical faith to it. One of the things we tend to forget in this early way of being Catholic, it's not an earlier way, but some people still the way they live, is that that routine was part and parcel, not just an expression of faith, but that routine was part of the comfort they received from that faith. So in other words, you get perhaps, perhaps the folks who are evangelical talk about saving experiences. And part of the saving experience that we speak here with this certain kind of Catholicism is not just daily mass, but that very much a routine. And now later on, uh, he gets inundated by the 60s counterculture, but not so much. As it turns out, uh, Paul Zimmerman, who is the uh, dean of uh, NFL writers these days, online and for Sports Illustrated, even in 1984 talked about interviewing with Marty uh, in the year before his death. Marty, who was uh, at one point rumored to become President Nixon's vice presidential candidate in the 1968 election, um, actually uh, was backing off of some of his criticisms of the youthful counterculture in the late 60s and the 70s, or actually the late 60s. Uh, and so uh, Lombardi, again, because he's a Catholic, you know, he's, he's, he's conservative, he's a social conservative, obviously, but he's not the doctrinaire, rigid, unyielding stereotype that we have for him. And that again, I think it comes from his faith. You know, Lombardi himself knew men who were gay in the NFL, and he would look out for and protect players who were like that, who, who were gay as well. Um, he uh, was the first coach to give African Americans a chance to play in Green Bay, which even today is Oklahoma White. And so, uh, even especially in the 60s, well, obviously Green Bay is in the north of Wisconsin, far away from Jim Crow territory. We think about the 60s and the uh, civil rights movement. South, it wasn't as if the good Lutheran Catholic folks in Green Bay and the environs around there were exactly open minded and welcoming you know, like folks in the neighborhoods. And Lombardi was the one to give black players a chance. And so, like, again, this, yes, he was inundated by the 60s counterculture, but not absolutely so. Um, one of the things you should get then also is that um, the, this is a, a phrase from Zimmerman. And Lombardi was a smart screamer. Um, something that, that, uh, that Zimmerman wrote in 1984. Quote, a nice guy isn't a very, who isn't a very smart coach, pardon me, will fail unless, I've seen this happen a few times, he writes, there's a nucleus of really solid and hip old veterans who realize they better protect you because they're never going to find a nicer guy to work under. But a tyrant who's a screamer who's also dumb will fail the quickest because no one will protect him. A smart screamer like Vince Lombardi had no problems, unquote. Uh, if anyone's a 
call it the Dallas Cowboys. This is all over sports radio even today. Wade Phillips is a player's coach. He listens. He doesn't cajole. And even on my drive down here this morning, uh, ESPN Radio was crackling with criticisms over how Dallas Cowboys do play up to their potential. Basically, they need someone to come in and kick some ass. And they, they need someone to get in their face. And for anyone who's ever played a minute in sports, knows what it's like to have the coach dress down in front of them. <laughs> you know what that's like, that's the fun. Um, and I'm going to come build on that in a second, but I'm going to take that in a different direction. Lombardi was the one who knew, this is Zimmerman's point, Lombardi was the one who knew how to throttle back at times. He terrorized the Packers. He was also the general manager. So the same person who was your coach, he then had to go and ask for a raise at the end of the season, uh, which in the 1960s yielded predictable results. Um, the NFL has never had the union representation, organization, and activism usually baseball has had. And one of the great ways you can study America's two most popular sports, baseball and football, is to look at their labor struggles. And the baseball players, especially since the 70s, started with Kirk Flood and got traded from the Cardinals to the Phillies in 1969. Baseball has always fought to the nail. It doesn't mean, of course, when this goes wrong, you have the 1994 player strike. It's very interesting to hear baseball scholars talk about professional football because uh, along with everything else, the way in which baseball scholars look down on football, uh, the George, George Will, the Washington Post columnist once said that football represents everything bad about America. It's uh, committee meetings interspersed with brief bouts of intense violence. It's a great, <laughs> great line to think about when you think about football. Uh, besides that, one of the ways in which baseball scholars talk about the, uh, the moral and honorable integrity of baseball Bear with me for a second on that. Is that labor activism in baseball has always been taken very seriously because baseball owners previously had baseball players over barrel. And uh, and one of the people who gets singled out for negative treatment on the baseball side of things is Vincent Barney, who would bust everybody's chops in practice and then after practice, and then say, Look, you're not getting paid. <laughs> you know, people would not get paid. And so, uh, you know, Branch uh, Ricky plays in, in baseball side, plays it. Branch Ricky was a for all the ways in which people talk about Branch Rickey revolutionizing baseball, which he did, uh, Branch Rickey was a cheap was a skin flint, and he did not like to play his player very much at all. Lombardi was the same way. What have you done for me lately? Where Lombardi excelled was not in the game. That's Bill Belichick and some other coaches who like a coach and they did not who were able to adapt to why Lombardi stress, preparation, and practice. And this is something that's kind of like a piece of the wall that's played an explanation here. Um, Dave Moranis has written about, you know, what, what epitomized the Lombardi approach the most was the Packers sweep, which is like everyone like, runs to one side or the other. A play that today, if you see a play that's a collegiate, for that matter, even the middle school level, often gets stopped because of the speed of the defense. And Lombardi's day, though, Lombardi was the one who felt that I don't know if plays in the offensive line. Zone blocking. Lombardi, okay, so Lombardi has a stereotype of being very rigid, and he, he had the Packers practice the, the end around sweep, so basically they could run it in their, in their eyes, in their eyes close. Uh, so it was committed to muscle, it was, a, it was a secondary reflex. Lombardi's point about that was, though, that in the game, the, the thinking was run to daylight. Lombardi taught his running backs to run not to a specific hole, like the three attack, but where the blocking opened up the hole. So in other words, in the moment of play, the great work is just something becomes like a jazz on something, very improvisational, like a run where the hole is. The best example of this, Miranda's claims, and he's got a very good point here, is the 1967 ice bowl in Milwaukee, was in Green Bay, Wisconsin, when the temperature at game time was minus 17, that's without the wind chill. With less than a, with less than a minute ago, the Packers were on the Dallas one, one yard line, trailing by three points. With 16 seconds left, Bart Starr called the Packers last time out. Now, Moran has described as going through Starr's mind at this point. One of the things that Lombardi would always quote in practice was 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. All the runners at the stadium are trying to win, but only one of them gets the prize. You must run in the same way. Run to win. So now you have the Italian Catholic coach goes to Mass daily, acting like a Bible self-fundamentalist, quoting scripture literally, run to win. 
star comes over and there's a big argument at the huddle over the sideline. What are we going to run? People are saying this. Some people are saying that. Paul Owen Corner, the, you know, the great running back from Notre Dame who played for the Packers, was actually a star of the Packers in the early years when Lombardi first got there. They say she'd run one this one thing. Lombardi simply tells the star, just run it. Let's get the hell out of here. And he turns back to the sideline and someone asks him, well, coach, what are they going to run? And Lombardi says, damn if I know. Most important play of his whole career. I don't know. They're going to run it. And it turns out that a star called one play, and then the, 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 the picture that you see, you know, where he runs the quarterback's feet, he just made that up at the line. You know, and, and so as Miranda's right here, the coach, it could be said, had nothing to do with that final drive in the game. Yet to every packer on the field, and to many of those watching from the sidelines and in the press box, that final drive, more than anything else, was the perfect expression of Vince Lombardi. The conditions were miserable, the pressure enormous, and there were no fumbles, no drop passes, no mistakes. Just a group of determined men who made confident down the field towards a certain goal. In his speeches, Lombardi had talked about character and action, and here it was in real life. And what you get from that, it seems to me, that, um, is now the question at one level. It's from here that you get these great uh, books, some of which are actually published by Vince Lombardi's son, books that cast Lombardi as a CEO, as a one person who wrote a man named Donald Phillips, wrote a book called Run to Win, Vince Lombardi and Coaching and Leadership. Quote, essentially Lombardi ran the Packers like any chief executive would run a successful business. Not only did he delegate, but he also expected excellent performances. People were given responsibilities, you know, and they were constantly reminded to take charge. They were basically left alone. This is also true for players. However, Phillips writes, if either a coach or player or a member of the staff did not do his job well, Lombardi would, without fail, hold him accountable, unquote. And so uh, you get this notion of like, what we call to win. What I would like to add, though, is a notion that Another place to understand Lombardi's thinking comes from another uh, branch of American life, and that's namely, especially the military in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, as President Harry Truman once said, uh, he, Truman being a former Army officer had very little good to say about the Marine Corps. Uh, Truman said the Marine Corps is an Army unit with good PR, basically. When you look at the history of the Marines, there are all these stereotypes in the Marines with the notion of jarhead from Anthony Swafford's book in 2003. Like, you know, it's got a shaved head, and, you know, so, you know, like, it looks like a jar, and, of course, as Swapper says, in the beginning of the book of the movie, a jar is empty. And one of the, uh, and one of the, one of the stereotypes of the Marines and the rest of the branches of the armed forces is, and this comes from an Iraq war veteran from 2008, they are, and I quote, double-barreled and single-helixed, unquote. This doesn't mean that the Pencil Party is a Marine Corps. He, he, uh, he never was a soldier. Uh, was rejected when he tried to join the Army. At one point, he was down as I tried to join the Army as a career choice. He was rejected for poor eyesight. World War II starts. He was rejected again uh, for being uh, for poor eyesight and being colorblind. And he received at least two deferrals uh, for being the main breadwinner in the family and for also being a teacher. Uh, deferrals that other people in Brooklyn and New Jersey did not receive. My grandfather served, served in the Navy. Uh, some of you all have parents and grandparents and some of you served in that war as well. And, uh, and it's very interesting that uh, Vince, who was perceived in the words of David Moranis as you know, the, the soldier priest coach, you know, he cut the mold of St. Ignatius of Loyola, uh, that, that Vince Lombardi never served. He talked at great length about the, the great things about the military. Never served a day in his life. Anyway, getting back to the Marines, in the history of the Marine Corps, one of the things the Marines is still stressed today, the Marines have the longest basic training of all the branches of the service. And in the branches of the service, one of the things the Marines stress more than the other branch, basically, uh, is heart and guts. What wins battles, what defeats the enemy, is what basic training creates in here and up here, in your heart and your mind. Uh, the Navy has aircraft carriers and submarines. The Air Force has all those funky, unmanned drones of the missiles that fly around with joysticks that go play on an Xbox or something like that. Uh, the Army has all sorts of great tanks and those Cobra helicopters and all this great stuff. The Marines have rifles and people. All those other branches of the service have special forces. They've got the Delta Force, the SEALs, and all they got the 
jumpers in the Air Force. The Marines have a recon branch, uh, which is actually predicted in the right from Generation Kill, like the 2003 uh, invasion of Iraq. But the vast opinion, and the majority opinion of the Marine Corps is that once you're a Marine, you're a Marine. There's no need to add anything onto it. And what makes Marines Marines, and this is something that they receive a lot of credit from, from other branches of the service, is their ability to bring concentrated fire in a fight towards target. In other words, what they're good at, what they're really good at. And at this point, it seems to me that Lombardi and the Marine Corps are very similar. They're perceived as being simple. The power sweep is a very simple play. Toss the ball, run back, everyone runs to the right, runs to the left, basically. When you break down the Marine way of coaching that, and it's emphasis on preparation, and then the players on the field get to make their own decisions, that comes very close to the way in which the Marines train the recruits. The men as well as women. Uh, the only thing that's different about Marine Corps training is that the women train on one side of Paris Island and the men train on the other. They're given the exact same regiment of training, breaking down the M16 and all that good stuff. Uh, and there's more focus in the Marine Corps on knowing your weapon, not just firing with live ammunition. Uh, in this sense, you know, the Marines come closest to understanding uh, Lombardi. Uh, even less than a normal has just got a little bit over a decade after Lombardi's death. But 1981, uh, books that were used in, in education classes about teaching PE. So in other words, if you're wanting to become a PE teacher and a coach of young people, the book, the textbooks then were already re referring to Lombardiism as this kind of medieval way of approaching players. Like, you, know, you, need to, you need to have a, what you might, so you might call an outcomes assessment view of, uh, of physical education. You need to get in touch with your players. Find out what their needs are. Listen to them. Don't be like Lombardi. You told them what their needs were. That's in 1981. Uh, and by 1984, already, Lombardi's view is being, you know, the kind of, as he's the has been, the new wave of studying, of coaching football was Bill Walsh, former coach of the San Francisco 49ers, who revolutionized football again by using a short passing game in the West Coast offense to replace the running offense. Now, of course, the maven of, of a professional football coach is probably Bill Belichick, you know, who is a very perfect, you know, again, he's, well, he's intentionally awful in public press releases because Belichick and that cold fish demeanor that he has is, is an act. It's specifically to blunt the other team's use of his words to use for inspiration. I mean, it's, 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 it's planned down to the last syllable, whereas Lombardi, you know, he wore his emotions on the sleeve, but he was unrepentant in town. And, and, and everything good about that, you know, and, uh, that, and you know, he, he would get in player's face, he would yell, he would scream, um, and, and he stuck by his players. You know, the, the, the Belichick has this notion of, like, you know, once you wear out your usefulness in our machine, we get rid of you. We kind of look at all the people who have played for New England, we now play for someone else because, you know, Belichick's the with the machine is anonymous. And so we've gone already on the two revolutions beyond where Lombardi was. And so therefore, you look at some of the things where he talks about this notion of discipline, you get this what I call the mystical sense of football as a discipline, that you know, there's this great ethic of contributing to something greater than yourself. Whereas if you look at Leo de Rocher, the vice guy's finished last, what you get instead is basically a way of, you know, do whatever you need to get ahead. And, and this is where the notion of like Lombardi reaching out to African American players, not in the sense of like the whole here to come here, but rather if you play well, you will get a fair shot from me no matter what. Keep doing what you're doing, you're playing hard everybody else. Lombardi saw that as a way of contributing to the team. The reason I mentioned this is Leo DeRosha was the man who let Jack who was the manager of Jackie Robinson, or would have been Jackie Robinson. Seven, had he not been suspended for gambling. Uh, and it was Leo who gave the final okay to have Robinson play on the Dodgers. But Leo's integration of the Dodgers is viewed cynically. The reason why Leo let Robinson on the team was he realized we're going to win more. Lombardi is viewed as this kind of like mystical saying that football is a religion and all people contribute to it. And there's this great thing called discipline. Leo had no use for discipline. Unless it was more than some, somebody else to get So therefore, um, one of the things I want to say about your face, uh, 
all you got to do is go to YouTube and type in George Carlin Baseball or Football, and there's a great, the, 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 the clip I remember was 1989, I don't know if he did it earlier, but there's a great seven minute piece by Carlin where he contrasted football and baseball. It starts out with, you know, baseball is played in the spring when everything's living, football is played in the fall when everything is dying. And it goes back and forth, the yin and the yang, baseball is summery, light, and wonderful. Baseball goes home. Football is a modern technological struggle. It's like death, you know, death to mind, border war kind of argument. Baseball play, but he's got a point there. Baseball is a pastoral game that is the past time. It reflects an earlier day. Uh, and there are a lot of people like Joseph Price in the book around the basis who grew up in a near in Georgia as a Yankee fan in the 60s. <laughs> Um, baseball is seen as a sport that gets in touch with American values as they were and should be. Football uh, is instead, like Carl said, a modern technological struggle that represents, you know, the violence of American life now. But also, Sal Palantonio's book from uh, from uh, last year about how football explains America. The only thing that's interesting about that book is that Palantonio talks about. starts out with the Giants and the Patriots in the Super Bowl. No mention of religion. But the NFL is inherently religious, you know, it, because if you know anyone who's a fan of the team, colors of who the good guys are, colors of who the bad guys are. There's a sacred calendar, which now includes the draft, as well as the beginning of preseason, separate, you know, days. There are separate, you know, like baseball season that takes forever. Which is one of the reasons why playoff baseball is so intense because the sport has always been around. Like baseball is just coming to the back of my mind. And then suddenly when the playoffs start, the same game, some of the teams so much more every pitch matters. Football, every game matters. And the notion of every given Sunday, unless you're a Detroit Lions. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, the football also, you know, like you know, baseball is very high bound in its rules. And if you compare numbers, like th there is such an, I'm not just saying this, Fan. Albert Pujols was about ready to win the Triple Crown for a decade in the 21st decade of the 20th, 21st century. The other person to do that was Roger Spornsby, who also played for the Cardinals. You can't do that in football. You can't compare anything from football today to when Vince was coaching 43 years and 45 years ago. The numbers don't calculate at all. Uh, I mean, the football field is still the same, but the numbers don't mean the same thing as they do anymore. And so therefore, football has this kind of egalitarianism, which is also a Palestine. It's is very American. You're not the home to ask in football. Um, whereas baseball, you know, there's Yankees will always have pins for it because they were. Uh, also, even the way in which the two sports manage their money, I'm not trying to pick on the Yankees here, but the Yankees are very wealthy. And football, going back to Wellington Mira and the Giants in the 60s, television revenues have always been spread among all the players. And so there really is a notion that, uh, there's a notion of equitable start. And the question is, what, everyone's starting out the same place, what have you done and what will give you? And so therefore, you know, we look at, you know, one of the things we all think, like, is, this is back to Harlan, at the very end of his uh, routine, you get this notion that uh, you know, football is in some ways is a military assault the notion of quarterback being called the field general. Whereas baseball, we know it's home. Um, football represents commitment to the like, achieving goals is kind of like, you know, you do what's necessary, even though it'll be very hard. Well, baseball is still the other guy that has to be some of the team. One of the things that happens here, I'm going to jump ahead quickly to uh, the 1966 ceremony here at Fordham, where Lombardi was given the insignia's medal by Fordham University. The reason why is because his, the person introducing him was his former boss, uh, Earl Red Blake, who was the coach of the West Point. Blake was a Presbyterian, the son of a Scottish immigrant, uh, and Blake grew up in Dayton, Ohio. When you read what Blake read about Lombardi, what you have there is a Protestant recognition that Catholics get winning as well. During the 40s and 50s, when West Point football was the juggernaut of American football, even more so than professional football. Um, when West Point was at its zenith, Vince Lombardi was the offensive line coach. 
developed zone blocking, not for the New York Giants, when he was also a co-assistant coach with Tom Landry, but previously at West Point, because the troops were disciplined enough to be able to think on their own freely. And Blake here said he kind of knows this. You get like an idea of the naming fundamentalist. You know, it's a great line. Of, like, he's volatile, but every controls, you know, because you can see Blake, who was very unemotional, never swore. His, the strongest word that Red Blake ever said in front of his, some of his players was eyewash. You know, every other word out of Lombardi's mouth started with an F, an SH, or a G. <laughs> Pick one. Uh, not as bad as Leo DeRocher. DeRocher is the DeRocher. What you have with Lombardi, and Miranda says that it's, it's at West Point that Vince Lombardi, the person, becomes Vince Lombardi the coach because he was able to combine his Catholic spirituality with this military discipline at West Point. In other words, and, and my point, I would add, is that um, for Lombardi to be the coach that he did, he had to go to some place like Green Bay. If Lombardi had not, um, if he had stayed here in New York, if he had been the coach of Fordham, he would not have had the same effect. Whereas in the kind of the Western Catholic context of Green Bay, a small West Bell town, 75% of its population was Roman Catholic at that time, Lombardi was able to use that family, military, duty, honor, bound ethic in a way that did not apply quite the same way here. Even though Lombardi and his wife also always viewed themselves as New Yorkers exiled out of the there was part of that as well. This Lombardi view was one of the highlights of his whole life, being recognized by his alma mater and being introduced as alma mater by someone who was not himself Catholic. And so you see this recognition by Blake that, you know, that this guy who used to work for me not only gets it, but has done it better than me than I could as well. In the end, though, the one thing I would think I would add, though, um, as Vince gets carried off here from this last, from the second Super Bowl, having to be the Oakland Raiders in Super Bowl too. Um, the, the downside from all this is that Lombardi is a Catholic. Was the price that he paid, um, and Miranda's writes about this. And it's a story. It's a, a subject of much more reflection. Lombardi died of cancer, uh, a colorectal cancer, in 1970, and uh, dying only three months after he was diagnosed with the disease. Uh, and of course, it turns out. Alter boys at his parish always comment on the fact that whenever he received the news, stuck his tongue after he received the host, they noticed that his tongue was jagged, chewing on it over the years. Over the intense, he was so intensely committed to winning a football that uh, he sacrificed to some degree his family life. This is the point that Lorenz makes. And some degree himself. Um, you know, you, you, the line from the whole steady song, he was drunk and exhausted but critically respected. You know, again, he was very well liked, and on the inside, he was chewing himself up. And so we have this, you know, this iconic coaching figure of, of what it means to be honorable and work with others for a goal, and they did it. I mean, it wasn't just words, they actually did it. That's the high school in 1967. And the price comes at that two years after this, he's dead. I mean, and, and it, it's you know, a shocking awareness that you, that you don't have Lombardi's an Asian coach of Lewis and Lake Don Shula, or Bill Walsh. Uh, he was there. He never had a losing season at Green Bay, or for that matter, the Washington Redskins for the one year coach there. And then he was gone. And there, you know, there was a price to pay. And, and in this sense, I think he literally, in some ways, paid for his own life. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Thank you. Is that, and this obviously doesn't apply to all, it's either all 
Catholic coaches or some other football coaches. But the fact you mentioned returning to the party, none of these guys are Irish. And there's nothing wrong with being Irish, obviously. Uh, but the, the part of the narrative of American Catholic history is that if you were Polish, especially Italian, or uh, French Canadian, the Leo Grotius case, you were doubly put upon. Obviously, there were uh, the American mistrust of a uh, Catholic power called the vote. But also, at the parish level, all these other ethnic groups had to deal with Irish and Germany. Uh, the bishops, the uh, the priests, the uh, nuns. Uh, and even, like, for example, even my wife's family, uh, the, the, the French Canadians live outside of Worcester, even to this day, uh, my mother in law's generation has a whole raft of stories. And uh, most of them are, they're all still Catholics. And but the bad guys in all the stories are always the nuns, who are always Irish. And um, I think one of the things that, and now, of course, you know, that doesn't mean all nuns are bad. I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to say anything about the religious life at all. But I think at the sports level, one of the things this does is two things. First of all, sports were a way out for Catholics. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, sports were a place where basically, especially in football, you can blow up a lot of steam. That's one of the things I think is interesting about the, the what I would call the ontological differences between baseball and football. You can't blow your stack in baseball. I mean, if, you, if you throw the ball to the marks, you're going to get mad. If you throw the ball to the ball, you could end up getting thrown out of the game because you hit somebody. In football, the, the very reason why you're there is to knock somebody's head off. I mean, you know, they get, uh, whereas, and you don't have that. You know, in, in baseball, Leonard Coppock said that the, the, the basic part of baseball is that you have to overcome your fear of standing until somebody throw something at you very fast, right past your face. Whereas in football, it seems to me the, the other side of that is that, you know, hit before they hit you. And I think that, comes back to your question, Angela, with uh, the, the kind of like ethnic Catholic coaching out there, is that, first of all, it's a way up socially. In the you know, second, in Paterno's case, very lucrative once you get to that level of college or professional sports. <laughs> but also as a place of freedom where in a previous way of practicing Catholicism, football especially, more so than the other sport, gave uh, a uh, an out for uh, dealing with the ethnic pressures of not being Irish.
all this does is kind of emphasize the, 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 the past time of baseball. Whereas, you know, know it's about how can we make baseball more attractive? How can we bring baseball back to the inner city? Only today, when I was riding the train up here, because I see two gentlemen in a parking lot of a used car facility on the way up to the Bronx, I see two guys, older, my age or older, playing catch. When you go through, you know, not just you know, New York, but when you go through cities, what sports do you see kids playing? Basketball and soccer. And, and soccer is a suburban sport, you know, like in all of them, like, you know, the kids in Albany City play hoop. Uh, and you know, they go out to the suburbs on Saturday morning, you know, and, uh, the, the parking lots are full of the SUVs and the minivans, and it's, you know, soccer mom to work. And all that does is emphasize the fact that, you know, Baseball is so high down that it seems like it can't adjust. Whereas, you know, there's a reason why I started peaking at six and not seven because kickoff's at eight thirty. Monday night football, and no one, no one argues with the buying demographic out of the NFL. And so it's not even just like a, it's not a cultural ethic anymore. It's sheer dollars and cents. The NFL makes money, lots of money, and. Who's going to get in the way of that? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it, now that doesn't take away, I think, from some of the aesthetics of it. There, I think there is an argument that can be made about you know, baseball as an aesthetic sport. As, you know, it's, there's a lot more going on with it. Football is a wild sport. If you don't like violence, football is not your thing. Uh, but that's you know, that, that, that transition has been going on a long time. You know, one of the things that they haven't done yet, I don't remember, it was about 10 years ago. Fox, when they covered hockey, had the glowing puck. Because if someone ever suggests that in baseball, they'd be shot, and rightfully so. I mean, we just can't deal with it. <laughs> you can't do that. But that lurking notion of we got to do something to spice up the game is always there and with baseball. And I think it's been there, really, for a couple decades, at least three or four decades. Part of your title was, if I remember correctly, the Catholic obsession with winning. Is that part, part, part of it? Yeah, yeah. Catholic contributions to America's obsession with winning. Winning. So, uh, I was wondering, and it wasn't totally clear to me from your talk, is this Catholic contribution? Would you say it's primarily toward winning? The obsession with winning, primarily cultural, primarily theological, a mixture of both. I would like to say it's a mixture of both, because at one level, but certainly cultural. I suppose it's probably primarily cultural, in the sense that it, when you have someone like Herbert Blake, the coach of West Point, saying, or Douglas MacArthur saying, "There's no substitute for victory," well, that's okay. They're Protestants at West Point. When you have the barely educated Leo DeRozier saying, "Nice guys finish last," well, now hang on a second. Now we're not playing there, and. Uh, but Leo was onto something in the sense that, uh, you know, when, one of the things that happens in the 40s and 50s is that when Catholics start espousing the same attitudes towards winning that other institutions like West Point have or were, that seemed to become a problem. Like Paul, around the same time as Leo says this, Paul Blanchard publishes American Freedom and Catholic Power. You know, and it's very interesting that like Blanchard actually uses DeRocher as an example. This is why we have to be afraid about Catholics, because Leo DeRocher basically gets kicked out of his job because of the Diocese of Brooklyn says he's a bad man, which is actually what happened. I think Blanchard is also afraid though that the cultural power of Catholics, and part of their cultural power was a certain way of being Catholic, going to mass every day at the same time, which for Catholics in the system, so to speak, very spiritual. This is just what we do. We have devotions and we go to mass and, and, and when the priest raises the host, we kneel. I mean, uh, all of that, the cultural power of that religiosity scared uh, the loss of establishment culturally as well as politically. But some of that cultural power, it seems to me, was this kind of religiosity that Lombardi didn't just embody he practiced it. He wasn't he was a little different in that sense. A lot of people look at Lombardi like, oh, he's this different figure. He's this iconic like, figure. He was just as much a normal Catholic as the parents and grandparents of all the folks in this room. But out of that practice, 
was perceived to be a certain kind of power. One of the things that seems to be to be where the performance within Lombardi is specifically involved is that Notre Dame might have set the trajectory, but there's still a lot more we have to learn about the, about the interaction between sports and uh, Catholic higher education in terms of pursuit of respectability. Because for a long time, you know, as, as much as some people in the audience and a lot of folks think Notre Dame football is this great thing, and today, Notre Dame is the institution is because it's football team because the football team makes money, unlike a lot of other divisions of football programs. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that in the 40s and 50s, much to Notre Dame's chagrin, they were not taken seriously by other non-Catholic institutions. You're just a football factory. In other words, you got a bunch of you got a bunch of knuckle dragging mouth breeders there that knock the crap out of everybody else. Well, what else are you doing? And part of that story is I think also involves like St. Rose is done by a women's college and uh, by, by a women's order, and you see this, you see that same motif developing. The pursuit of sports is a way of like increasing enrollment, especially for men. Men and alumni get more than women alumni, the numbers say. And there's a besides the notion of trying to fill out like how other Catholic institutions like Florida or Catholic University, which at one point had a national competitive football program. Played in a couple uh, bowl games, like the Sun Bowl, for example. St. Mary's out in Marine, California. One of the things that's in Marina's biography, which is something which was brand new to me, I didn't know this, there were routinely annual games scheduled. I actually had to go check the Fordham, the FordhamSports.com archives to check this out. There, were, there was an annual scheduled game with St. Mary's uh, outside of San Francisco, California, who came here every year to play Fordham. You know, there was a, and because at one point, the, the headquarters of college football in this country was New York and West Point, not South Bend, not Ann Arbor, not Southern California, New York. And that story has yet to be told, as well as the way in which, you know, this is Julie Burns' book about uh, the Immaculata College women's basketball team in the 70s, the way in which women's colleges use sports, one, you know, for the, Issues you may like in terms of like a, a being and you know, like basically um, perceived better, but also you know, like a, it's physical activity. You know, at one level, sports were used in college school for college as part of the curriculum. It's a way of like you know educating the whole person. And for women, that meant you know like you know, kind of having a certain kind of persona appearance and things like this. And so sports, it at one level you start parsing out even further. It depends on. Like what religious order found in school, men's order or women's order, and at you know, what time you're examining, because sports did become either a symbol of the institution or originally like part of the curriculum. And you're right, there's a lot there, you know, and I think that you know that's when you get out to like the Midwest, all the Midwestern schools have football, Catholic schools have football teams, St. Louis, Marquette, they all have. And they gave it up for some reason, but they all kept basketball. Basketball is traditionally seen as the Catholic sport because it was a cheap sport you could play at a parish. Football is a rich kid's sport. That's what Ivy League and West Point is for. It takes money to get more. Yeah, what, thank you. You segue exactly into my question. That is, it seems to me that when I was doing my book on uh, for the day, and the day, yeah, was it? No, was it? Yeah, no. no. <laughs> it seemed to me that what I found out, and I didn't know this, my whole family except for me went to the day. Fordham gave up football, serious football. They were trying to become academically very serious. I mean, there was a time in the 30s and 40s when Fordham had the first serious graduate school among Catholic institutions. And Notre Dame did not. And I think the presidents of Fordham, Gannon and others, said one of the ways that we're going to achieve real academic respectability is to sort of kill our big national life. At the same time, the University of Chicago was the same kind of love. The University of Chicago was one of the biggest football powers. And of course, they gave all of that up. And their library now stands where Stag Field was. Uh, and I think Fordham followed that. So to some extent, what was the power of this Catholic institutional desire in places like Fordham and other Loyola and other places to achieve real academic first rank respectability in killing in a, in a way that Notre Dame said, no, we're gonna put money in this, we're gonna make you know, in the days before Notre Dame was a research powerhouse. It was primarily a football school. Yeah. And was there a, what role was that? What role did, did the academic respectability part play? That's something I'm wrestling with. 
not so much in the, because in this project here I'm focused on professional sports, but well, one of the reasons why I mentioned my own, you know, my own employer, St. Rose, is that it, when issues of Catholic identity come up, issues of Catholic identity just get parsed out different in men's, in schools run by men's orders, in case of the judge or something, the, the next door neighbor for us is Siena College, who plays Manhattan, in basketball in Fairfield. Um, and, It seems to be at one level, the Notre Dame was excelling at football in a way the other schools weren't. At some point, I can let this gets back to the question of the games with Ryan, the games with Ryan. At one level, it became basically uh, limited funds where we going to spend our money, I think. And the other thing was, the, and this is proceeding with the John Tracy Ellis uh, article, uh, speech, speech, which he first gave her at Ford, and it was published in the Thought Magazine, also published here at Ford, with, you know, the Catholic, American Catholics and Intellectual Life, is that the in an earlier day, as chewing sports success was seen, in other words, I think at the time, it, it didn't seem like, it, it didn't seem like that, it seemed like a logical choice to make because you could either pursue football and potentially with the fact that you could spend a lot of money and never be successful as no day. And for example, you know, like my alma mater, Indiana Wabash, used to play no day all the time, and routinely beaten by Rockney's teams by the scores of like something like 66 to 5 or something ridiculous like that. Until the last year when we finally beat Notre Dame once, I think in one of the rock games last year or something, maybe it was six or one of them there, we put him in a cage. I don't know, but someone other than one one. And the reason why I say that is that you know uh, Wabash was kind of sort of Presbyterian at that time. And the head coach at Wabash was a Catholic by the name of Pete Vaughn, who was a classmate from Notre Dame Rockley. And Rockley always said basically, you know, my buddy Pete's down there teaching those five beta Catholic kids how to play football. I've got the real players up here. And it seems to me that, you know, but at, at the time that Ford and St. Louis and other school, other Catholic institutions, founded by men's orders like the Jesuits, started dropping football, is that the Notre Dame had already cornered the market for that another term, it seems like. And so then they are, I guess the, 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 the notion of trying to compete at a lower level schools didn't seem to be an option then. And for whatever reason, football was dropped as opposed to scaling back on it. You know, like, you know, and Division three football is enormous. If you ever heard of Mount Union, you know, they're, they're a juggernaut. Uh, and the team that routinely beats up on them, or occasionally beats up on them, is St. John's University out of college, which is the Catholic school. And so even at the, the lower levels of the NCAA divisions about dealing with football, it's, it's, there's still Catholic schools there. Some of which are very good. Some of them, like, like St. John's, is very academic respectable. Since it might not be heard of too much here, but you know, say the history of St. John's and the history of Midwestern Catholicism is it's pretty influential. Yes, sir.
on the outside. Of course, they were, like I said, there's a stair step over where the jar has a little bit of the middle. Lombardi would view, I think it just seems like Lombardi would be in agreement with the Marine Corps in that sense because he would say what matters is how you practice and what you know. And then when you get in games, can you execute what you can? It has nothing to do with being more violent. So he would say you need to be, you need to, it doesn't matter who you have there or how violent they are, can they work together? That's what I think how he would view it. Be that as it may, though, uh, getting back to Father Mass's question, not everyone's you know, it, it's just football. Uh, and God, for, forgive me for saying that, you know, but I think a lot of other folks, you know, in, in religious orders and, and, and Catholic institutions, clergy or not, would have been concerned about other things. And the notion that everything hinges on what 11 guys do out in the field for a lot of other folks would be, um, seems kind of like, you know, like an overemphasized at a particular point where it's really saying it's in the arts, or architecture, or whatever. <laughs> you know, I think uh, that especially you know, in the Jesuit stories, I can very easily see Jesuit schools wrestle with the problem because there are more Jesuit schools that are founded by them than those founded by the Congregational Holy Cross. And Jesuits take the intellectual positive very seriously, and so football seems to threaten by the Jesuits who are there to begin with, but the football has to go, not the academic standards. Whereas, you know, Notre Dame was able, Notre Dame's also, like, it's the Western School, I, I can realize that even in the New York Daily News, you get a call about Notre Dame football, the notion of the subway alumni, so there's, there's something different about talking about Notre Dame here in New York. Notre Dame's always had a great ball in the city. Uh, followed by generations of men and women who never set foot in the state of Indiana. And that early success allowed Notre Dame to answer the questions about intellectual spectacle and athletic success definitely went important for those schools because Notre Dame was so successful. They were the one team routinely got to beat up on the Ivy League in schools like Army and Oklahoma and State Schools. Whereas for all the success that the Florida team had, even when Chris Lombardi was here, that success was rather episodic by comparison. And so the intellectual the intellectual pursuits here at Florida were there had to be in other words, it would seem more than more of an available option, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But that's a very, you know, there's, it's, Lombardi would say, I mean, yes, it's violent, but you just don't want to be mindlessly violent. And, uh, you know, think about how we think about the Marine Corps. Like, on the, the external, we look at people in the military, like, oh my goodness. And if you listen to people who, like, you know, you talk to people who are drill instructors, they take the ethical and moral formation of recruits very seriously. We're not just teaching them how to fight, but, you know, to basically learn how to flip a switch between fighting the enemy not shooting civilians. And that's something that Lombardi is trying to work out as well, that, that, that football is it's not just like success in the field, of course, is important, it's vitally important, but there's a moral formation part as well there. That's what Moran talks about, uh, you know, the, the spiritual exercise, the spiritual exercise being very practical, kind of spirituality, formative. still say that that's typical of American culture, like, I mean, with all the, like, you know, fascination with, like, I don't know where I'm stealing that phrase from, but fascination with abomination that's in today's younger culture, like, would you still say we're all about winning morally? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, in a word, Sal Palantonio's book, How Football Explains America, is a great example, because uh, he, in some places, the book is, is, well, first of all, it's very accessible, it's a popular written book, it's not like Scholarship. But it's a great book because it, it recounts the history of football and he, he does a good job of connecting the development of football to the development of the position of quarterback and this notion of our American need for heroes. So that part is good. Moral. One of the places where he then, I think, the book kind of falls flat very quickly is, and I cannot remember the name of the artist, but he quotes a rap song about basically uh, with a, a one of the chorus, one of the lines of the chorus is, I'm going to make you 
say my name. And Palantonio lets that line go by. We'll see, this is all just about playing hard. Now Lombardi and De Rocher, during the game, would stop at nothing to win. And De Rocher was dirty. I mean, he, he would pick fights, he was a great book that published out. He liked it. They basically know now that DeRocher was stealing signs. So basically, Bobby Thompson knew that uh, Ralph Bronco was about ready to throw us, uh, a high fastball. So, you know, the great home run has now been deconstructed. But after the game, DeRocher was known, for example, for taking, you know, the manager of the team out for dinner and taking him to dinner bill. So, you know, like, you know, once now that we're not playing, you're all buying a drink, you know. And so, like, oh, I'm sorry I called you a bastard and all these other things here. I mean, let me buy you a steak. You're onto something there because one of the things you should get, and you notice this is one of the reasons why the NFL sometimes called the no fun league, is that one of the things the NFL cuts down on is excessive celebration as a way of taunting. And okay, so grown men who are making millions of dollars do this, no one really cares. But you know, I've got kids in city soccer leagues and things like that, and I don't teach my son or my daughters to uh, you know, score the points and you know, try to intimidate the other kids or whatever. And I. Uh, this gets into the question of like of, of athletes as role models, and uh, I think Lombardi would be very, uh, along with you know the kind of fact that as Vincent, as Louis Roche once said, whatever happened to sit down, shut up, and listen? Uh, you can't say that to players anymore at the professional level; they're making more money than the coaches. But players, when they when those moral questions are ignored. Players are still moral leaders. I mean, those are the ones the kids see on ESPN, which is effectively their moral formation. And that's one place where I think we've, we've really gotten away from this stuff yeah, that Lombardi was talking about. But the Rocher, of course, didn't get paid by the He was running out of scrupulous. But Lombardi did. I mean, he was really concerned about the football team in Green Bay meeting something. They've been here in you know, about an hour. You know, the, the Packers in the kickoff again, they let the, the games in. Minnesota, but you all know, like, basically the games on Sunday almost didn't matter, and I'm not saying they didn't matter, of course they did, but you know, everyone's talking about what's going on here about an hour, because Brett Favre was playing his old team, it's the oldest morality plays, and that's not just what's going on the field, you know, they're, um, and it's not even just something that galvanizes the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, it's something that's it's a national playing out of, of issues, and so when you see these figures, especially like NFL, or in some cases I see also NBA players, getting caught up in like Michael Vick, or Plaxico Burris, like carrying a weapon in where he shoots himself in a nightclub, you know, like those kind of things. So those kinds of issues really undermine this moral issue, that's precisely one of the things that baseball scholars, for whatever reason, love to talk about, not maybe not major league baseball, but baseball as a sport, as being inherently much more moral than football. Well, I'm not saying I agree with them on that, but I think it's a very interesting, you know, baseball fans, all the stuff about steroids and professional baseball, carry themselves, view football with a very jarnest eye, precisely with that question of the celebration of domination. It's very interesting. Yes, it will. Yeah, and I think that's a, I, I would agree with you. My favorite college team are, is the Nebraska Cornhuskers, because of the corn there. And I, and I took Tom Osborne very seriously. 
experience as a, as a moral role model when I was playing high school football myself. I played on the offensive line, and I, I took Tom Osborne's approach to the game, and the style he played, and his way of doing the game as a moral endeavor very seriously. Same thing also with Vincent Marty, I don't think I'm going Whereas someone like Barry Switzer, whose dad was a former bootlegger, and also coached for that evil institution down at the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> all these moral issues there. Um, the, when Tom Osborne finally had success in the mid-90s, it came at a certain price. And we don't see that being associated with, the only thing that gets said about Paterno is that he's, uh, that he's, he's been there a long time. The, the moral questions never pop up with Paterno or with, 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 uh, with a lot of Catholic schools outside of the league. Again, Notre Dame is an exception. Like everyone can like Scrutiny. Whereas, you know, uh, Tom Osborne, a very devout Methodist, one, though, with Lawrence Phillips, who was, I mean, a, a bad excuse for him, right? I mean, he was a bad man. You know? And uh, the fact that he won without suspending Phillips, who was, you know, potentially guilty of a felony offense of, of a battery, uh, you know, morally compromised Osborne's legacy outside of the state of Nebraska. Uh, whereas, That tradition there by the Catholic schools or Catholic coaches at non Catholic schools. There is something to that about like an ethic that the, 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 the sport itself becomes what's forming us. Well, we're basically receiving moral formation without like, having to take a class about moral formation, which is a success in and of itself. I mean, like, you know, this is when they, when they talk about the heydays of Notre Dame football, uh, the where Notre Dame men received their knowledge about Catholicism, the last place they received it from was in the catechetics classes. They received it in places like Franco Mallet's English classes and things like that. You hear that. You know, so, in other words, the, the moral formation comes as a totality, not just in one place. Please join me in thanking Thank Jeff. You for very Jeff, I know you want to continue this. Uh, if any of you have questions, please feel free to go, Jeff. Thank you for coming.